going to read an introduction for our speaker tonight. Um, bear with me because I haven't read this too often out loud. Spencer Suderman has achieved much success in his life. As an information technology professional, he is a recognized thought leader with key industry certifications and a master's degree. In his spare time, he is, he is an accomplished aviator, air show pilot with two Guinness World Records, and is currently preparing for a third. His secret to success is embracing failure, giving up hope when success seems impossible, and letting negativity take over. <laughs> Spencer learned that only when you hit the bottom, and only then can the mind become unencumbered and lead you to success. And with that, let me introduce Spencer Suderman, our speaker for tonight. Thank you, Bob. Thank you. Thank you, Big Bear Pilots Association, for inviting me here to speak with you tonight. So first you're saying, who is this guy? That's a great introduction. I know, I wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> so I, this is what happens a lot. People call me crazy. I like to fly airplanes upside down. I like to spin them more than anyone else has ever spun an airplane upside down, inverted. So first they call me crazy. And then they ask how I did it. And then they want to know why. And I'm going to tell you all that tonight. But first, what is an inverted flat spin? By the way, we'll do some Q&A at the end. I've got a quite, let's say there's some burning question you must get off your chest during the presentation. Let's save it to the end. I've got some really fun, interesting stuff to talk about, and then we can have a chat. So what's an inverted flat spin? Let's have a look. This is from an air show last year. Oh, sorry about that. You see that now? You can sit down. These are all short videos. So that's what it looks like from the ground. And that's in the pit. That's in a pit special. That's my view. Oh, don't you see that little sign that says no vomiting is prohibited? It really does. Cameras. I can't count. I can't, can't count to ten. I don't know, but I did. Okay. So let's let's talk about this maneuver a little bit. Why I pursued it, and and I think that's where the the story starts. So I started flying air shows in 2006. Um, but if we back up a little bit, I actually got my pilot's my private pilot certificate in 1997. I actually started pursuing that in college in the late 80s. And as most college students uh, are, I really didn't have the funds to pursue. A pilot's license and I took a lesson here and a lesson there and you, you, you can't do it that way. So it wasn't until I was out of college in the working world I was able to pursue my pilot's license. Got it in 1997, uh, did my check ride in a Cessna 152 and I don't think the examiner was thrilled about that. So right away I got my instrument rating and I started flying around having fun Then I pursued a commercial rating and I started realizing that if I'm going to have an instrument rating and a commercial rating, and, and as I expanded my own skills in flying, I learned, I think, what we all learned, which is, you know, flying really happens in three dimensions. And today, they teach flying in two dimensions. As you know, the FAA doesn't require spin training anymore. Uh, they teach this idea, and I'm a CFI as well, and I'm very familiar with these regulations, and I don't agree with a lot of them, but, you know, there's the minimum requirements, and there's what people ought to do to be safe in an airplane. And everything I've done, is, is really about becoming safer as a pilot in an airplane. And I encourage everybody to do some of those same things. It's about being the safest pilot you can be. So there I was, you know, in my 30s, I had a family. We, we would enjoy renting airplanes, going to Santa Barbara for dinner, to Elephant Bar when it was there, flying back at night. You know, nothing anyone here hasn't done 100 times, right? Or gotten, you know, $1,000 a year and $100 hamburgers. Yeah. And I started hearing about these spin training and unusual attitude training programs to teach you what to, what if, what if you spin. And all I remember from my private pilot training is it was all about how do you avoid a spin. We're going to stall the airplane, but we're not going to spin. And we're not even going to really stall it. We're going to, that horn's going to go off. And right before it actually stalls, you're going to recover the airplane. 
And you never really even learn what a full stall feels like. And if you've ever been in a, in a full stall, you know with the yoke all the way back, you get the nose way up and you see blue sky and the airplane stalls, the nose drops, and now you're looking at the ground, you're going, what just happened? And, right? Now, you should do that. Everybody should do that. Everyone should learn how to do that and should be completely comfortable doing that. And, and from the right altitude, it's a very safe thing to do when you're taught how to do it and you're comfortable doing it. But that's not how it goes today. But I have always been a person who, when he pursues things, I don't just dabble, I go all the way. I mean, really far. This is really far. So I go all the way. So I said, I need to learn how to spin airplanes and be safe. So I went to Santa Paula, and they offer an unusual attitude, a Rich Stoll, if you're familiar with his name. Um, and if any of you have done that, you're, I see head shaking, you've flown the yellow and black to Capron Zero Three Hotel. I have a lot of time in that airplane. I think half the pilots in the world who do aerobatics have flown that airplane. That airplane's probably got four million hours on it. I, I mean, no kidding. They've rebuilt that so many times, it's unbelievable. So I did that. I took the unusual attitude training course, and I felt really comfortable. I had a great time. Never vomited once, got sick a lot of times, queasy to the, almost to that point, but never did. And I always came back for more. And it was actually while I was finishing up my instrument rating, I did that. And it, there were weekends where I'd fly uh, the, the cathlon on a Saturday and go do an IFR flight on a Sunday. You want to talk about extremes and flying styles. And I got through all that, and I thought, wow, this is really fun. I'd like to keep doing this. Got my tailwheel endorsement, started flying aerobatic contests, and soon discovered, if any of you have done aerobatic contests, you spend a lot of time and resources and money, you train, you practice, you burn gas, you hire coaches, you do all these things, you go to a contest, and if you do really well, if you're in the top three, you get a $2 trophy after you spend thousands of dollars to get there. <laughs> but it's not about that. It's about having fun, being a better pilot, it's about the things you do here, pilot camaraderie. It's about being a better aviator. And then one day, this opportunity to buy this Pitts came along. Some people I was flying with at Santa Paul said, hey, we're looking at this Pitts S2B. It's for sale. You want to come in on it with us as a partner? And we're all out here doing, con I said, well, I don't know, maybe. Well, I was building an airplane at the time. I was building a one design, a low wing aerobatic plane. So I have this half built project in my garage, which was going nowhere because I'm busy working. And this opportunity to buy a Pitts comes along that, you know, the minute you write the check, you could go fly it. So anyway, I get involved in that, of course, because that's how things go. Got rid of the project and started flying my plane. Now, in the hangar next door is an airshow pilot named Bill Cornick. Maybe you've heard of him. He's local, Southern California, flies a white and green Pitts. Bill checked me out in my plane. And over the years, you know, we got to be friends. He goes to air shows. Bill said, you want to come with me and be my crew? Sure, I'd love to. I'd love to go help you with the airplane at air shows. Hook, line, and sinker, right in. So what did I learn from hanging out with Bill Cornick, who's only been doing air shows for 30 years, who's been got more time in the pits than most people alive? What did I learn? If you do aerobatic contests, you spend a lot of money, all your fellow pilots and friends critique you. Not only they critique you, they write down how bad your flying is and give you a, a sheet that says how bad it is. And if you do really well, you get a $2 trophy after spending thousands of dollars. But if you go to air shows, you don't have to fly perfect. You know, contests are about precision. Airshow flying is about smoke and noise and fun. The loop doesn't have to be perfectly round. So you can go up there, you can be sort of sloppy, as long as you have good discipline. You put smoke and noise in the air. When you land, everybody claps, and before you go home, they give you a check. Now, I will tell you, zeros on a check are way better than zeros on a score sheet. <laughs> and that's how I became an airshow pilot. Great. But there's more. There's always more. So, of course, here I am. In 2006, a newly minted airshow pilot, I got my first low altitude waiver, and I realized, you know, I'm not the only guy with the pits flying airshows. In fact, I'm one of many. And it's really hard to differentiate yourself, and, and especially as being a new guy. How am I going to book airshows? How am I going to get out there? How am I going to get known? Who's going to find out about me? And, you know, there's industry organizations and all these other marketing things you do. But there was something that was very interesting. There was a guy who had a world record for most inverted flat spins. Does anyone know who it is? Wayne Hanley. Anyone heard that name? No one knows Wayne Hanley? Wow, my, my, my negative marketing must really be doing good. <laughs> Wayne and I are talking again now that I've broken his record, but there was a time where you know, he didn't want to chat with me much. Um, in fact, I think he was um, sending poison scotch to my house, but that's not story. <laughs> so as an airshow pilot, I'm thinking, I want to differentiate myself. And, and I looked at Wayne, and by the way, Bill Cornick, who trained me, and Wayne Hanley were good friends. They competed together and against each other um, all the time. So my friend Bill Cornick, my mentor, my, my airshow competency evaluator, said, you know, you could go after Wayne's record 
it helped Wayne get more air shows by being known as you know the world record holding air show pilot. I said, that's a great idea, and I happen to like the inverted flat spin. It's really one of my favorite maneuvers. So I pursued that. And we'll get to we'll what get to these Wayne's other records. Record? What? What was Wayne's record? Well, seventy eight in a Giles two hundred two. So we'll talk about how, what I beat his record with the first time, but it was seventy eight, um, and that's a lot of spins, inverted flat. So I looked at this record and, and looked at other records. And before we talk more about this record I broke, I'll show you some more videos. But let's just talk about aviation world records in general. So who set the first world record all in one flight for speed, altitude, distance, and endurance? Right brothers. And right bonus brothers. points when? And right right brothers. Well, which right, which right brother? Orville, I think. Orville. It was Orville. You're right. It's Orville. All in one flight, he got to 10 feet of altitude. He went 6.8 miles an hour. He flew 120 feet for 12 seconds. The guy set four records in one flight. <laughs> Who would not want to aspire to that, right? So I started looking at what world records are out there. And here's where it starts getting fun. So there is a record for highest uh, altitude achieved by propeller-driven airplane in this modified Grobe. Guy went, it's, it's kind of off the screen a little bit, it's 60,897 wow. feet. That is really high wow. in a propeller-driven airplane. Wow. What's the fastest airplane? An SR-71. I, I can tell you I don't have the budget to build an airplane that fast. Distance. This is where Rutan gets involved, right? Um, 25, it's a little, again, off screen, 25,000 miles. I think that took him like eight days. Do you want to sit in a little metal tube for eight days? But they did an endurance record of nine days in the Rutan Voyager. Those are some pretty extreme records that require a, a team, a huge team, a lot of planning, and more importantly, a lot of budget. And we're all general aviation pilots, so I don't have to tell you about the limitations of budget. All right. So why the inverted flat spin record? Well, because it's easy, and I know how to do it. I have a plane that can do it. So I had the right equipment, had the right airplane, pit special, loves to spin. You can spin a pit special all day. I already own the airplane, so I have to go out and buy it. I just need to train, um, work up to it, and, and it's just cool. <laughs> it's a cool airplane, and it's my air show airplane, so it would be cool to go to air shows in the plane that I broke a world record in. So what do I do? I start, I start training for it. I start figuring out how many spins can I do in this pits. Can I break Wayne Hanley's record? What are the capabilities? Now, who goes out and tries to see how many spins they can do in one flight on purpose? Well, I do. And there were like three other people doing it. They've all stopped now because I set on my second record, it got so extreme, they all gave up. So I went out and figured out I could do a bunch of spins in my plane, but I couldn't really get up into the flight levels where I needed to go because it's not easy to take a VFR plane into IFR airspace. But I've done it. I'll tell you how to do it. It's actually really easy. But I didn't know that at the time. I didn't know anything. Because how dumb do you have to be to say, I'm going to go break a record for most spins in an airplane, right? Pretty dumb or crazy or both, a <laughs> little bit of both. But I learned a lot along the way. So I said, I'm going to go break this record. And my airplane is certified. It's a certified factory-built pit special with two magnetos. The only upgrade it had at the time was a three-blade MT propeller. Normally, they came with a two-blade aluminum prop, the crank cracker. Those things will crack your crank. So everybody puts a three-blade prop on to protect it. So I start doing spins, and I could never get up as high as it would go. I really hoped. Hope is a great strategy for accomplishing nothing. But I hoped it could get to 25,000 feet. I would go break this record. So where do I do it? I did this at El Centro, Naval Air Facility El Centro, where I was doing air shows. I had a, started building a good relationship so I could use it, not at the air show, but the adjacent um, bomb range airspace, I could use that or become a bomb, you know, in the desert one way or the other. <laughs> so I go up on March 10th, 2011. It was the day before the air show um, started that year. And I climbed that airplane all the way up to 21,000 feet, as high as it would go. It's an airplane with two men. This is a certified airplane with a 260 horsepower IO540. I tried to. It, it, it's got symmetrical wings. It's an aerobatic plane. It flies great below like 5,000 feet. It is not made to go in high altitude. But I got it up there somehow. Uh, and between 20 and 21, 000, I would tell you 20,000 feet of service ceiling because it was only climbing about 100 feet a minute. It took a long time. Got that other thousand feet. I go up there, I roll inverted, I put it in a spin. By the way, all these videos, if you, go on, if you look me up on YouTube, 
all this video is out there. I video everything. If, I, if, if there's too many cameras on the airplane that can't take off, I'll take one camera off. That means it was too many cameras. But I video everything, and, and not so much because I like watching videos of myself flying, but I do. But it's a training tool. By videoing what I do in the airplane, I can watch what I did wrong and learn from it and constantly improve. Plus, you need cameras to count the spins. So that's how we count them. With, you can't count them yourself. You're too busy watching the airplane. So I go all the way up to 21,000 feet, roll inverted, start a spin, recover at 2,000 feet above the desert. I started the recovery at 2,000 feet. I was level at about 1,000 feet above the desert. And that's one thing about flying in a plane like this. You need to know your airplane. I know my airplane will recover from a fully developed, full power inverted flat spin to level flight in under 1,000 feet. Because I've done it more times than I can even count. So you need to know that. So I fly all the way back to El Centro, all happy with the video. And there was a big crowd in the desert. They organized a whole caravan of air show people to drive out and watch <laughs> me do this. I'd smoke on. You could see the trail. It was brilliant. It was wonderful. Spectacular. Um, as I'm going back, somebody, um, one of my colleagues had called the, the tower and said, yeah, he did a lot. So I get a call. I call the El Centro Tower. Say El Centro Tower, Pitts 260 Golf Romeo, five miles out. They said, congratulations, we heard you did 93 spins. I was like, really? Someone called. And I know how fast my airplane spins. I have a lot of data. Everything I do is about collecting data. I have spreadsheets like, like, like a crazy person makes. I have data like you wouldn't believe. I figured I would do, I estimated if I, I, I could do, if I got to 25,000 feet, around 80 spins, enough to break Wayne Hanley's record. I didn't get that high. So when they said, nine, I'm like, maybe I, you know, this is unknown, right? This is, a, as Donald Rumsfeld once said, this is the unknown unknown. So I thought, maybe I did it. And I realize now, when the t guy in the tower said congratulations, I should have taken the little SD cards out of the cameras and thrown them out of the air vent on the airplane and have no evidence, except the guy on the ground who thought he knew what he was counting. So we get back, I land, the judges look at the video, <laughs> 64 turns. Far short. I mean, so short it wasn't even funny. 78 was the record at the time. And I was beside myself. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know how I missed it by so much. What did I miss? What didn't I know? It turns out I didn't know a lot. I had failed. And it's not like I did 75 turns and I'm like, okay, what am I going to do better next time? I mean, I missed it by a mile. This was an enormous failure of research, of education, of training, of knowledge. So I kind of put it on the table for a while. I'm going to focus on my air shows. I'm going to leave this alone. And I'm just going to go about my business. And about a year later, I started thinking, there's got to be a way. How did Wayne Hanley do that many spins? Now, granted, his playing spins a little faster, but I need to know what I don't know. I need to get the known, known unknowns. If I can get to the known unknowns, they'll know what I don't know, and I can figure out how to fix it. So I started doing some research again. I said, well, I'm going to have to go higher. 21,000 feet, clearly not high enough. So I started calling people who know better. So does anyone know who Bruce Bohannon is? Someone's heard that name. Bruce Bohannon set some high altitude records in small piston engine airplanes in the Exxon Flying Tiger in the late 90s, early 2000s. He was, his goal was 50,000 feet. He made it to like 47 and a half. Another, another person ripe with failure, but he still broke the record. So he missed it by a little bit. So I called up Bruce. Turns out he's a really nice guy, and it just so happens he has a Pitts S2B he teaches flying in. And I told him what I want to do, and what did he say? You're crazy. <laughs> But tell me how you think you're going to do this, because he was interested in what I want to do. I said, just to be clear, I'm not trying to break your high altitude record. He said, okay, good. <laughs> right, we can, he said, we can talk now. I said, but, but here's what I'm trying to do. And he understood the, the maneuver. He understood the airplane. I said, I've got to get this plane to go several thousand feet higher. And, 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 and you know something. You know things. And I want to know what you know. Bruce knows a lot of things. He knows more ways to turn an airplane engine into a boat anchor in one flight than anybody I've ever talked to. <laughs> but you might break a record doing it. He said, do you have a sponsor and what's your budget? I said, no, and not much. He said, well, and you have a certified airplane. So you're somewhat limited to what you can do. He said, really, the best thing to do is advance the timing on your magnetos. And if any of you are familiar with engines enough, you know that in, in car engines, airplanes, boats. If you advance the timing, especially as you go higher in altitude, you'll get more horsepower out of the engine. Or you'll maintain, you won't lose as much horsepower. He said, you'll have to adjust that manually. This is a manual thing. And when you take off, make sure you don't give it more than about three quarters throttle until you're up above 10,000 feet, or you'll detonate your engine. 
So uh, just a quick, and I, I'm trying to keep this discussion non-technical. This is more about how crazy I am. But most of the magnetos in your airplanes are set for 25 degrees before top dead center. That means that spark fires when, when the, the crank is 25 degrees before the top. The spark starts to fire, starts the burning of the fuel. So by the time the piston gets to the top of the cylinder and goes down, you've got a fully developed flame front, they call it. And, and the, the fuel air mixture is, is expanding, forcing the piston down. But it's not adjustable. It's a compromise. It works great at sea level, but it doesn't work as well the higher you go. So it's a compromise. And, and does anyone know how old the Magneto is? Mm. It's older than the airplane. It was invented in the mid-1800s. That's how old it is. And that's how slow we are to innovate. So Bruce said, you need to advance your timing. Um, he said, don't tell anybody because you have a certified airplane. You're not supposed to do that. He said, or you can get electronic ignition. There's a few of them on the market. He said, but they're all for experimental airplanes. You could put your airplane in experimental category and throw one of these electronic ignitions on. He said, but the key is you've got to find a way to advance your timing. That's the only thing you can do. Otherwise, you go experimental and go hog wild crazy and do all kinds of cool stuff. <laughs> okay. And th this was a little bit of a problem for me because as an airshow pilot with a certified plane that's two seats, the advantage I have is I can take people flying at air shows, do media rides, sponsor appreciation flights, and not have any issues with the FAA, certified airplane. And I'm insured to take people flying. So I can just write it in my contract, I'm going to do some rides. So that's, that becomes a problem. Then I read a press release around late 2014 about a company called ElectroAir in Michigan who had just certified the first electronic ignition for four-cylinder airplanes. So I, and they said there's a six-cylinder system on the way. So I see that press release, like they did it, Sun and Fun. They announced it. I call them up and I talk to the owner and I said, hey, how you doing? Gave him my spiel. Here's who I am, here's what I want to do. What did he say? You are crazy. <laughs> he goes, but I want to hear more. He said, let me think about this. Let me think about what you're talking about. And I thought, that's it, I'm never going to hear from him again because, you know, people don't call crazy people back. But he called me a few days later. He said, I talked it over with my partner and we like it. We like what you're doing and we like the marketing value. He said, but we have a little bit of a problem. Um, in, in trying to get our six cylinder system certified, we need airplanes to test it on. And if any of you are familiar with how they test equipment to put on, or how they certify equipment, like an ignition system, you have to take an airplane that is otherwise certified, like a Cessna, make that, you have to put it in an experimental category, make that one change, put that one piece of equipment on, do a bunch of test flying to collect data, which they then submit to the FAA to show that this, this thing will not you know, kill anybody. So he said, we really need a single, a single engine airplane with a six cylinder like homing engine. I just happen to have one. I think we can work together. And we did. So what we had to do is we put my airplane into experimental R&D for a short period of time. We installed the first certified candidate version of the ignition system. This was in 2014. And I started collecting data for them. That's the real work I did. The, breaking the record was the fun marketing piece. The real work I did is I helped them get their thing certified by collecting data they could use to give to the FAA to get their certification. So we get to um, December. Now, by the way, the El Centro Air Show is typically in March, and I had all this ready to go. I felt confident. The plane climbed a lot. In fact, there's a video. The first time I flew this thing on the flight levels was off of Santa Barbara. The FAA, I got permission to go in. It used, you know how you get permission to take a VFR plane in a Class A airspace? You ask. You just ask. And they give you, con like, as long as the weather is visual meteorological conditions, and the controlling um, authority is not too busy, they'll clear you in a Class A, give you a squawk, you got a <laughs> transponder and a radio. It's really not that hard. You just ask. I prearranged it, but you, you know, I didn't take off and go, hey, I want to go up to like 23,000 feet. It, it, you know, it's easier to do it ahead of time, and I did. So I took the airplane to 22,000 feet off the ocean, off Santa Barbara, which is where they wanted me to fly this thing. And remember, I'm in a pits, single engine pits. I'm like 30 miles offshore, <coughs> over the water, and a plane with an ignition system, you know, that is new to me. It's freezing cold. And you want to talk about scared? I mean, I'm not normally scared. I was scared. Because what if something happened? Could I even glide? Could I even go to, to like Carpinteria and get to the beach? Because the water's cold and there's sharks. And all I could hope is if I had to go in the water, I'd get eaten by a shark before I froze to death. Because that takes a while. Just hopefully a shark bites quicker. So we got through that. I got to 22,000 feet. The airplane still had some climb. But um, uh, I was uh, too scared to stay up there. To be honest, I was too scared. I, I, I want to go back to Camarillo. I, I proved my point. So I went back to Camarillo, 
and I felt I could do this. I, I worked with my friends at El Centro. This is the value of relationships you build over time. This is a military air, 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 air facility that is normally closed to the public. But because I had built good relationships, they allowed me to come there, not during the air show when they normally let the public in, use their base, use their airspace, and, and, and pull off this little stunt. They had a SAR helicopter ready in case something went wrong because I was flying out over the bomb range. I mean, they were really supportive. And it's amazing what you can get if you just ask. That's one of the things I learned along the way. Just ask people. So I went from 2011, where I failed miserably, had no idea why I failed, researched the heck out of this thing, talked to everybody I could, and I'll tell you, when you start talking to people, before I get to how I broke, how, how we failed on this day, let me get to that failure, when you start asking other pilots how to make an airplane go higher, well, the answers you get are like, wow, off the ch you think I'm crazy? It, I, I bet if I went around this room and asked 20 pilots, what do I need to do to an airplane to make it go higher, I would get 25 different answers. And, and, and half of them might work. Everything from turbocharge it, supercharge it, nitrous oxide injection, get a two-bladed prop, get a three-bladed prop, get a two-bladed metal prop, get a prop with you know, funny bent tips on it and all kinds of, I mean, it's all over the charts. Um, there's only so much you can do. So I, I, and then I said, I don't want to get more spins out of it. Nobody can answer that question. Mm -hmm. No, everyone can tell me how they think I can make the plane go higher. And you're all thinking about, how would I make my airplane go higher right now? What kind of crazy stuff could I, and there's things out there. VGs on little, you know, vortex generators, there's all kinds of stuff. And I've played with it all. I've experimented with everything. And some things work and some are just a huge waste of time, but they're fun to do. Um, the days I took off from Camarillo with little bits of yarn all over my airplane and cameras, because I was doing airflow studies, and the tower's like, why does your plane look like a furry cat? <laughs> right. But I was chasing a record. That's how dedicated I was. I would do any. I would even look silly in my airplane, which is not easy for me. But I would look silly in my airplane, flying at my home airport to try and accomplish something important. To that, really nobody cares about. Let's be honest. Who cares? So, everyone could tell me how they thought I could make an airplane go higher. Nobody could tell me how to make it spin faster. Literally nobody. Not even Wayne Hanley. He had no answers. So I had to figure it all out. And, and I, I flew a lot. I videoed everything. Um, how much weight is anyone here willing to put in the tail of their airplane to put the CG as far aft as possible? No one wants to raise their hand? I put a lot back there. I put a lot of weight in the tail of the airplane to find out how fast. And it does spin faster the more aft the CG. And it's a pit, so it'll recover, I hoped, the first couple times. And then I found out the more I tried that, and it would recover. And, and, and I felt more comfortable doing it. I did it a lot. I wasn't going to go out and do this in the real world going to a relatively low altitude without knowing I could recover with a lot of weight in the tail of my airplane. So I just told you one of my secrets. <laughs> you should see the chart for that thing, how far back the siege. It's like crazy. So we get to this date, and I wanted to do it before the air show. So I got all this permission worked out. Me and my crew go out there. We have this, this big, we have the TV news cameras out there. I mean, it was a big deal. I thought I had this thing nailed. So what do I do? I get up to 20, a um, little over 22,000 feet. The plane was still climbing, it probably could have, but so slowly I thought I'd better stop. I roll over, I do, I enter my spin, I recover at 2,000 feet, I'm level at 1,000 feet, I go back to the airport, my judges are there, take the cameras off the airplane, stick the little SD card in a laptop, the judges count. 77 turns. How on earth can I miss it? Even tying Wayne Hanley's record by one, but I needed two more to break it, right? More, I mean, I mean... He had 70, I needed 79. To Guinness, more is more. But, you know, one is like, there's a word for that. But, um, <laughs> more, uh, anyway, 77 turns. How, what, what on, what on earth? So I reviewed all the video. And just, oh, by the way, on the way down, when you're falling that, when you're falling at 10,000 feet a minute, what's happening to your ears? Well, it's only like 7,000 feet a minute below 10. It's like 10,000 feet a minute at 20,000 feet. So what's happening to your ears? They keep clogging, right? And you keep, you'll see in the video I'm going to show you in a minute, me holding my nose and blowing to clear my ears. So as you're, as you're descending, you know, and when your ears clog, your ears are clogging, and when they clog, you can't hear as well. So at about 9,500 feet, and I know because I, I went through video frame by frame, about 9,500 feet. Um, and, and by the way, while I'm spinning... I'm constantly adjusting the mixer. How lean do you think you're flying at 22,000 feet? <laughs> really? So anyone who has a, uh, a six-cylinder engine know about how many gallons per hour you burn on takeoff, roughly, 540? 
how, how many, roughly? 20 to 20. 20, 25. Depends on the plane, but 20 to 25. So at 22,000 feet, I'm burning 7.5 gallons an hour in an in a IO540. So you have to keep increasing the mixture or the engine is just going to quit. So what I'm doing is, by the way, in a spin, you're on the right rudder. You've got the stick in the corner. Your hand's on the throttle. The mixture's down here. What am I looking at? I'm looking at, I'm not, I'm not even worried about altitude until I get below 10,000 feet. I'm worried about the health of the engine. I'm worried about oil pressure, oil temperature, exhaust gas temperature, because that's how you know your mixture. And every so often I will, like, what's the CHT doing because I'm scared to look. CHTs are pretty hot at that altitude. Anyone know the limit on a 540 for CHT temperature offhand? It's 500 degrees. It was 475. I hit 475 before I entered the spin. What? Cylinder head. The limit for cylinder head temperature on a 540 is 500 degrees. Hit, and I have a JPI in the airplane, a gate. So hit 500, I'm sorry, 475 at 22,000 feet. So things were pretty hot. I was cold. I was freezing cold. It was like minus 10. And I had like long underwear on and a flight suit and a jacket, but I was cold and the engine was hot. And, and here I go screaming down. And if you watch the video on YouTube, you can hear the controller, you know, clearing me to do the maneuver. There's like, normally controllers are so smooth on the radio. This woman was like, uh, 260 Gulf Romeo, you're cleared to, uh, to like, like, like she's thinking, am I clearing this guy to go kill himself? That has to be what she's thinking. Anyway, so we do the spin and I'm one short. I look at the video, my ears are clogged, about 9,500 feet. I notice my EGT is starting to come up. So I reach down to adjust the mixture. Put my hand, then I clear my ears. No, I keep going about 6,500 feet, and my ears really hurt. So I clear them, and, all, and, and, and I could hear again. And I notice it's quiet, to quieter in the airplane. I know what the airplane sounds like, but it's quieter than I would expect. And, there, and, and my hand's already resting on the throttle. I go like this. Oh, no. I must have pulled the throttle back when I adjusted the mixture at 9,500 feet, just a little bit. So I was running maybe three-quarter throttle for 3,000 feet. That's how I missed it, by two turns. A little bit of throttle came out. But I didn't know that until I watched the video. Failure, huge failure. What do you think my checklist said on the third try? Check the throttle. So I actually wrote a little checklist with an arrow with my scan. My scan was altimeter, oil pressure, oil temperature, EGT, check throttle. So every time I went through that, check throttle. So even when I moved my hand, the mixture is right below the throttle, throttle mixture, I would check throttle. That was not going to happen again. That that was that was pure flight management. That was a, that was that was a that was a helmet fire. That's a loose connection between the seat and the stick right there. That's what caused that problem. That was not going to happen again. So I, I worked with my friends at El Centro. We decided I would try it again right before the air show, since I was coming to the air show anyway. Got out there on Wednesday. Normally, air, normally we would arrive Thursday. Thursday morning, March thirteenth. Waited for the weather to clear. Went out to the practice area or their bomb range, climbed up to 23,000 feet. That last 1,000 feet took a long time. It, it, the plane went up to 22 pretty quick. It was like 12 minutes to go that last 1,000 feet, but I wanted every bit of altitude. I was not giving up. Do my spin, recover, go back, look at the video, 81 turns, and that's a world record. So that's how I beat Wayne Hanley's world record. And I was all happy, and I did my air show, and life was good, and my sponsor was there, and they were the ignition system people, and they, got their, they actually got their certification two weeks later. And which was just a coincidence um, when the data got, it had nothing to do with that world record flight, just when the FAA did their thing. And then, I, and then when all the dust settles a couple weeks later, I'm sitting there with my pilot buddies. Everyone has pilot buddies who encourage them to keep doing bad things in airplanes, <laughs> right? Everyone knows what I'm talking about? Um, and we're going, so you beat Wayne. You beat the legendary Wayne Handley by three turns. What are you saying? We're saying you only beat them. But to Guinness, more is more. But you can't help. You know, you know I can't help myself. None of you can help yourself. How am I going to break this record again? How am I going to do this again? I'm not going to do it with that airplane. I, I ringed every bit of performance out of that airplane. So what am I going to do? i got to go higher, and i got to spin faster. So let's talk about how I did that. So this is the Pitts S2B. This is my S2B. And of course, they're up. you have to show these airplanes upside down. I can't show them to you upright. That's not allowed. So that airplane's 19 and a half feet long. And the engine and pilot, the main centers of mass, are a certain distance apart. And we all know how CG 
mass arm works. So the farther apart things are, the slower things turn. The closer in you get the mass to the center of gravity, the faster it turns. So I figure I have to get a smaller airplane. So I found a Pitts S1, which is a much shorter airplane, single seat. And I needed it to climb. Now Pitts S1 normally has a 0360 engine. Um, the power to weight ratio wouldn't be necessarily much better than this. So I found one with a 540 on it. Imagine a Pitts S1, 1,000 pound airplane with a 540 on it. So I found one that was roughly 200 pounds lighter than my S2B. Acquired it, did the mods I needed, put electronic ignition on it, and went and did the record. So let's talk about this, this spinning thing, because there's a, because this is important, this is an important idea. We've all seen ice skating. And you know, when the ice skater spins, like everything's far away from her center of gravity, there's a certain speed. Now she pulls everything in tighter and goes faster. There it is, same idea. Shorter airplane, everything's closer to the center of gravity, so a Pitts S1 naturally spins faster. I just needed one that would go higher, and I found one. Let's go back for a second. One more. So that airplane, I prepared it, and I made the attempt again. This time I worked with Yuma, with Marine Corps Air Station Yuma. It was a little easier to get their airspace. They own all that airspace. Didn't have to go through a lot of hoops, and the amenities out in, in Yuma are a little bit better than El Centro. So look, you noticing a pattern here? Two failures and a win. So we go out there. November 22nd, 2015, it's nice and cold, I wanted that, and I climb up to 24,000, a uh, little up 24,500 feet, roll the airplane over, start spinning, and it's spinning fast. I can't, I mean, it didn't even spin that fast, because I'd never been that high in the airplane. And I'm having an issue with seat, with seat belts, all, and my head slipping, and my body slipping, my head's hitting the canopy, <coughs> so I aborted the maneuver. Flew back to the airport with my tail between my legs. What went wrong? It was a seating position, seating was reclined, not uncommon in aerobatic airplanes, but reclined seating, which is great for positive Gs. When you're inverted and spinning and your body's being thrown to the outside of the airplane, it's like a ramp pushing your head into the canopy. So my head was like this in the canopy. And that was causing my neck muscles to tighten up and blood, which is now pooling in my head because you're upside down, could not get out. It was painful. I mean, I felt like my eyes were gonna just go boing. So I aborted the maneuver, went back to the airport. We thought it was just, a let's redo the seatbelt somehow. So we got a new set of seatbelts, more, se I, I was wearing two complete sets of seatbelt harnesses, strapping me down so I wouldn't slide up. So I go back to Yuma a month later, and I got a little further, about 24 and a half thousand feet this time, got a little further, got down to 15,000 feet, same problem, I was still slipping, my head was in the canopy, it wasn't working. So my crew chief and I, like, what are we gonna do? Now my crew chief, who's also a pilot, used to be a race car driver and builder, he said, we need to re-engineer the seat in your airplane. This was this recline. He said, we got to put upright seating like in your S2B. The S2B has this upright seat. So he engineered a race car seat into the airplane without modifying the airplane. I mean, genius. Using clamps that went around the tubes. And we got this aluminum race car seat. And he built a, he welded a subframe. We clamped it in there, put it in. Now I have upright seating. Worked great. Seat belts worked great. And went back out to Yuma March 20th. Climbed to 24,500 feet. And did 98 turns. Blew the record, actually it was 98 and a half, but Guinness wouldn't give me the half turn. I guess they can't put decimals on the certificate. So blew it away. What was my, now everyone, and everyone says, why didn't you just do 100? <laughs> what, what do you think my goal was? 100. And maybe on Tuesday, this was on a Saturday, maybe Tuesday I would have done 100. And maybe Thursday I would have done 97. And I think, you know, there's the temperature, the atmosphere, there's, there's things you just can't account for did the best I could. It's not too shabby. It's not too shabby. So while I'm talking about the rest of that, let's go. I'm going to run the video in the background while we talk about what was going to start. So this is, this is about a five minute video. It includes me getting ready. There's my crew chief, Carl, strapped me in this little airplane, put my oxygen mask on. Cap all about the cameras. It's always about the cameras. So there's the view. So you're going to see my view doing this. How do you feel about this stuff? She has a really nice new car right now that she's driving. <laughs> really nice. She had just gotten it. Any other questions? How about before she had the new car? She had another, uh, only a few year older car. Aviation's very expensive. Very expensive. So I'm getting ready here. This is early in the morning. It's nice and, it's nice and cool out. It, uh, it ended up being 80 on the ground. 
That's kind of a janky looking panel, isn't it? I didn't make too many mods, did only a few things. So I take off at 841. This is, remember, this is a thousand pound airplane with an 0540 engine on it. It climbs really good. Good's the word. So there, here I am at 24,500 feet. Can everyone hear that? My crew just like was dying of curiosity how, so they called on the radio. They knew about how long it would take them to get up. They happened to call it at the top. Okay. This is, this is um, for me breathing. It's just, com and, and, and body heat. It's frosting up on the canopy. It's actually in a little spot. You can see here just where the camera is. So this is me entering the spin. You're gonna see that altimeter. Watch, every time it kind of pops into view, watch. You ever seen altimeter on wide that fast? At that altitude, it was like 10,000 feet a minute. It was, the descent rate was about 7,500 feet a minute, below 10,000 feet. It's like zero G. It's about negative 1.5. You're upside down, but because of the spinning, you're getting a little bit of transverse G. So here I'm kind of marking 20,000 feet, I've done 16. I had to go through this frame by frame to pull all this data out. Everything I've done with this whole project has been about data. I told you I got spreadsheets like a crazy man of data, engine manifold pressure, RPM, oil temperature, oil pressure, how fast the airplane spins, how fast it falls, how much weight in the tail I need to put in to make it spin faster. This is what the judges used to count, because one of the cameras on the outside actually failed from the cold. They're just watching those um, sod farms go by. And it's not really that, it's not rocket science. What does the, oh, that's just the camera shutter. It's a full, it's a wide open throttle. It's actually running, you can see this digital tack, it's only running 1800 RPM. Um, interesting thing I learned, that with a fixed pitch propeller, I, I experimented with both fixed pitch and constant speed propeller, it spins faster with a fixed pitch propeller. That's what I flew with. And that's a whole other discussion why and how, but you know, I don't want to bore everybody with a lot of technicalities. And notice as I descend, how the RPM increases as I go down. Right, manifold pressure increases, but the propeller is not moving air. You know, the airplane's not moving forward, it's spinning and falling. So, and this is wide open throttle. You can't even see the, the CHT here, but it's like right near 500. Believe me, I saw that. I was thinking about that. That was in the back of my mind. So what am I thinking about here? My foot's getting tired. My arm's getting tired. When's it gonna be over? This was um, about three minutes. So I'm getting a little lower there. Okay, that's where I broke the record, 5,300 feet. You know, frame by frame, I had to go through this to figure that out. I knew from all my data that if I could successfully spin and everything worked right, I would do around 100, plus or minus. You know, you can see the altimeter is coming up on 3,000 feet. And you know I'm staring at that, right? At this point, that's all I'm looking at. I don't, by now the mixture's full rich, I'm staring at that altimeter because I, I cannot blow through that recovery altitude. Face full of desert. So now I'm leveled off about 800, 900 feet, I think. I'm trying to get my, collect myself before I fly back to the airport. This is right in front of the terminal at Yuma. They had set it up so I could pull right in front of the terminal where the news crew was, the judges were. There was an airliner right there. They were looking at me like, what is that guy doing over here? Spin complete. All the way down? All the way down. All the way down. There's people over here like clapping. Gnarly. <laughs> <laughs> oh, a couple French words. I tried to bleep them out. Feel the aluminum seat. So that guy, that's actually Mike Koblick. He's the president of Electroware. And it's solely because of that ignition system that I've been able to do this. All right, we're about done with this. Okay. So any questions? I have a little more time. Yes? After you, after you finish your spins and you level out, does it take long to get your head together and everything as far as are you like dizzy and you know, all this stuff? I, I flew around for a good five minutes. 
So I wasn't dizzy. I don't get dizzy doing this. But what happens is you're hanging upside down at about negative 1.5 Gs. There's a lot of blood in your head. And if you saw when he pulled out a big blue thing, that was a headrest we built out of um, foam yoga blocks from Walmart that we glued to get, we, we gorilla glued together. Because one of the things we figured out is if your head goes back when you're spinning and you're trying to hold it forward, you're tensing all these neck muscles because you need to see the gauges. And by tensing all these neck muscles, you're holding the blood in your head and you're building that blood pressure and it's painful. So we had to find a way for me to relax and just let the blood flow. So the best way was we got these yoga blocks. It's 10 bucks for three of them, in case you're interested. <laughs> Not that I do yoga. And, and we glued them together and cut the back and put Velcro on them and, and they were just right behind my head. So I could, so literally sitting up, there was about a quarter inch. All I do is just relax my head and let it rest against there. Didn't have to keep my, my neck. These are things like you wouldn't normally think of as a pilot, right? Interesting. So I don't get dizzy, but all that blood in your head and then you suddenly go from negative 1.5 with an easy pull. So this airplane took about 800 feet to go from inverted to recover to level, because you don't want to high G yourself. Even if you pull three Gs, you were at negative 1.5, it's a 4.5 G excursion, not a three G pull. So that's what you have to be concerned with. So easy pull with a really tightening everything up good. And what bothers you is the movement of all the blood. So you feel it in your head. Um, your body is, you know, got used to that position for three minutes. And now your body has to say, okay, let's, let's return to normal. And you're, you're just, you know, your head's swollen. If, you, if you, you saw the video, my face is swollen. And you're just, you're, you're, you're just, it, it's like an overwhelming physiological set of feelings. So I flew around for a few minutes. I climbed back up to about 3,000 feet um, before I called Yuma Tower and told them I was coming back in. So a few minutes to kind of just relax and go back in. Counted them and we're done and succeeded. So, and everyone says, well, what's next? Well, I didn't break 100 spins, so what is next? Oh, uh -huh. well, let's go back. Well, we'll get to shenanigans in a minute. Come on, back up, back up. Okay, so my pits S2B. Did 81 turns on March 13, 2014. Wasn't satisfied. Picked up the Sunbird. Sunbird S1X is its official name. It's a one-of-a-kind airplane. Um, 98 turns on March 20, 2016. Okay, now I know the success recipe. I know how to build the cake. I need a Pitts S1, but I, and the one with the 540 was a little heavy, but most Pitts S1s have a 360, four-cylinder. So I need a lot of power without the weight. So I found a Pitts S1, very common Pitts S1C. Actually, the first Pitts that Curtis Pitts sold plans for it. So I found this airplane with an 0360, and all I cared about was an airplane and an engine that runs so that my buddy could fly it home for me, because, you know, I'm not going to fly it across the country. That's too scary in a Pitts. <laughs> And they can't carry much luggage. I mean, all you have is that little space right there. So we get it home, sent the engine in a Penyan Arrow. If you're familiar with Penyan Arrow, they build engines, okay? Um, they built the engine in this airplane, not this one. They built an engine for this. They took an O3. How much horsepower do you think you could massage out of an O360 engine? Anyone want to guess? 300. Well, I can't tell you. It's a secret. <laughs> <laughs> they dynoed it at 250. So... Yeah, it's pretty close. They dynoed it at 250. Now, keep in mind, that's in a test cell in Penyan, New York, with no ram air effect, and also without the low um, atmospheric pressure to reduce exhaust back pressure. So they're estimating it'll probably do another 20 or so once it's in the airplane flying on a 780-pound airplane with me and my gas probably just probably close to 1,100 pounds. I can't wait to fly. Right now, it's in Santa Paul at Ray's Aviation, and the fuselage and the engine keep getting closer together all the time. So there's a lot of, they're, they're doing a lot of, I, I think it's going to get flying around June, maybe early July, and then I can start getting ready. So I believe, based on all my calculations and spreadsheets and all my craziness, that this airplane will go to 30,000 feet, and I can do 120 turns. Yes. Evidently, you don't figure that the carburetor will affect your altitude rather than having an IO 360? What's a carburetor? <laughs> it, it has a fuel inject. It has fuel injection. It's an IO, okay. Yeah. So, well, it's, it's, it's a uh, Frankenstein. <laughs> so it's the engine, they, the engine that came off the airplane was a pretty run-of-the-mill 0360. 
What I sent them, I'll never see again. What they sent back was an engine that's still an 0360. They built it up for an 0360. Um, 12 and a half to one compression pistons. It's not gonna last long. Um, helicopter cam, high lift, high duration. So what, what, what do you have to do to a normally, act, by the way, we talked about turbocharging, turbocharging, supercharging, right? Every crazy idea, nitrous oxide injection, things that'll turn your engine to a boat anchor in a heartbeat. So just one second. So what we decided on, well, I just got told what we're doing. How's that? Um, cause I trust them. They said, we're going to build you a high compression engine that breathes really well. That's the goal. It's got to breathe well at high altitude. Obviously, I have electronic ignition. So 12 and a half to one pistons, ported, polished, high lift, high duration cam, four and a one exhaust from Sky Dynamics, cold air intake, fuel injection. I think there's some other stuff in there. They're afraid to tell me they did to it because I won't want to fly it and electronic ignition. <laughs> it, it can't not be fun. So you got a question, sir. Didn't the P-51 Mustang have a certain air intake or P-51s were supercharged. So we talked about how to, people have done it. There are super belt-driven supercharged engines running around, and we looked at how to do that, and the, 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 the one-off engineering was just beyond um, my thin wallet was the problem. So we, we feel, based on the lightweight of the airplane, so I mean, what, it's really basic. Lightweight, high power, power to weight ratio. By the way, why did I choose the Pitts S1C? Because the Pitts S, most, Pitts or aerobatic planes have symmetrical wing, right? Same on the top and the bottom. The S1C, the original Curtis Pitts design, is flat on the bottom. It's actually called the flat wing Pitts. So when you fly them inverted, and I'm not really flying it inverted, I'm spinning it inverted, but when you fly it inverted, you need a little more nose up. But these have a 10 knot lower stall speed. So we think it'll, it's good for a little more altitude than a symmetrical wing airplane. I'm just guessing. This, this is a guess. This is a, uh, a confidence thing. We, we feel... By we, I mean like me and the mouse in my pocket. We feel like this is the right approach. So, yes? Yeah, I'm trying to wrap my head around the, the wide open throttle. I understand you don't want to go back to idle because it's shocked over the engine, but why, are you, why is a wide open throttle, how is that giving you more spin? It seems like it would be. So, great question. So, why wide open throttle and in inverted flat spin? So, in a normal spin, upright or inverted, Normally, you pull the power to idle, you enter the spin, and the airplane will spin with some level of nose down attitude, right? A lot, some of you have done spins probably. It doesn't matter whether you're inverted or upright. To do an inverted flat or an upright flat spin, you need full power. You need the gyros, you need the high propeller speed and the principle of gyroscopic precession. Everyone familiar with that? Okay? Everyone play the little gyroscope, you pull the string and it spins and you push it here and it moves that way. Just like a helicopter, if, you know, really, if you, if you push on the rotor here, the effect happens 90 degrees ahead of the direction of rotate P factor, right? One of the four elements of why you go to the left when you take off. So you need the gyroscopic precession to drive the maneuver. So the normal inverted spin, you're kind of nose down, but you're not spinning very fast. Add full power, the nose pops up, and it spins flat. So you must have, and the, and the, the but you can't have too much RPM. Too much creates gyroscopic rigidity, which slows the airplane down. And again, this gets into the whole talk of constant speed prop versus fixed pitch, light prop, heavy prop, where's the weight at the tips in the middle. There's a lot of stuff that goes into this that I experimented with a lot of it to figure it all out. That's some secret sauce. Was there another question back there? The record for a flat spin upright. No one has one. Okay. It's a waste of time. Who cares? <laughs> <laughs> okay. What sounds more cool? A flat, an upright flat spin, or an inverted flat spin? Ooh. Come on, the inverted just sounds more cool, doesn't it? <laughs> you know, I, that's a good question. I don't think anyone's pursuing it. I'm not, because the inverted one is just like, wow, and he's upside down. It's like that Top Gun line, but we were, because we were inverted, it just sounds better. So, so the current goal, 120 turns, 30,000 feet in a Pitts S1 with a ridiculous amount of horsepower. Now, even if it only goes to 26 or 27, I'm still going to break 100. Maybe I only get 110. That's good, and I think I'll be done. Wow. Amazing. So that's where. So let's. Uh, big day. No, next. Okay, let's just have some fun. Let's take a break for a second and just show a fun video. Two aerobatic pilots in a pit special biplane with a bottle of water. <laughs> what could possibly go wrong? I'm on my way to the Camarillo Airport, 
we're going to do the barrel roll water trick. Let's try not to spill any. I'll try not to. All right, ready, set, go. Just a demonstration of G-forces. Who thinks we did that right on the first try? <laughs> There, there's another video, it's online, if you go on YouTube and look, look up my channel, there's outtakes from this, there is water everywhere. <laughs> so the guy in the front seat is actually Bill Cornick, he's doing barrel, he's, this is a barrel roll, and in the barrel roll, you're flying like this, we're trying to keep one G. So, you know, it's one thing to do a barrel roll, it's another thing to do it with perfect yaw, so that the water doesn't go sideways. So there's, there's some funny videos online of me pouring the water and it just suddenly goes out of the cup and goes sideways on the canopy. So if you're gonna do this, just trust me, use water, don't use Coke or iced tea. <laughs> it, it'll work a lot better. So one more thing and we'll wrap up. I have a student who's a very talented young lady um, who just got her tailwheel endorsement. And, and she's been flying with me doing some aerobatic training and this is a video. So everyone's heard about how hard the pits is to land, right? I used to think that too. Okay, watch this. So she's flying the airplane. She's in the front seat, and you'll see, I'm just covering the controls. I've got my hand around the stick, and my hand around Right, I'm just, I'm ready. Okay, props in, put the mixture in, but she's doing all the flying. I'm doing all the sweating. Right, slide the, you can't see over the nose, so she slid the nose out to see, see the runway. Oh, AOPA uh, broadcast this on one of their web channels. They saw this video and they were like, that's really cool. We have to share that with a lot of people. Watch the sink rate. Okay. Power out. And now try to let it. Bring the nose up. Now you're a little too high. A little too high. Let it down. Good. Stick back. Stick back. Little right rudder. Holy <laughs> <laughs> All I heard was a beep. Don't worry about the break. Don't worry about the break. Let it roll. Revel in the glory. Let's get a right rudder. Good. Your girl from here left the Charlie contact ground point eight. Good day. Charlie ground point eight. Okay. You. All right. That was pretty cool. So for me, as a flight instructor, that's an incredibly proud moment. Incredibly proud moment. So before we wrap up, are there any last questions? What do you do for a living to support that family? I'm a computer geek. What do I do for a living? I'm a computer geek. I work in IT. Okay. Which? Where do you do have to have your wife? Right she has a really nice car. A really nice new car. <laughs> <laughs> question, where do you keep your wife happy? She always has a really nice new car. Um, part of my um, background in IT and going to business school and understanding the value of data in making decisions in the business is really what helped me accomplish this. You know, it's one thing to say, hold my beer, I'm gonna go do some inverted flat spins. <laughs> it's another thing to figure out how to do more, how to make the airplane go higher, how to break the record again, how to collect data, how to, how to, how to look at data, how to, how to interpret data, how to, how to gain insight from the data. This was less about the flying, because every flight was an opportunity to collect data to do something different, different throttle setting, a different manifold pressure, weight in the tail, weight not in the tail, a different altitude, a different something, collect the data and understand what it means and then apply it to the next time and get better. And there are no big giant leaps. There's no like, aha, I suddenly went from doing five turns per thousand to seven turns. That's really what it comes down to. How many turns per thousand feet can you do? What's the average amount you can do? and you start to understand how to you know, extrapolate out how high do I need to go based on what the airplane did on actual spins and, I, and actual performance data, can I calculate what would it be another 5,000 feet higher? So it really became an exercise in, just like you would do in a business, I need data to make decisions about what to do next. Yes? How long have you been flying 
flying planes for? I've been flying planes for a couple of weeks. <laughs> <laughs> I am kidding. So I started flying in college in the late 80s. I got my pilot's license in 1997. I only have a couple thousand hours, which, you know, is or isn't a lot. But you gotta remember when you fly a pits, every flight's like 40 minutes. There are no long pits flights. So I have a lot, you can look at my log book, the one I sort of forget to write in. But if I did write in it every time, I, there'd be pages and pages of really short flights, like all less than an hour. Yes, sir. Does the density altitude make a difference in how many spins you can make per thousand? Feet? Yes, big difference. So if you looked at a chart of the Pitts S2B, it's fairly linear. I found above 20,000 feet, it was doing about three turns per thousand. And as it got down right before the recovery, at about, you know, once I got below 5,000 feet, it was about five and a half turns per thousand. It makes, it makes sense, right? Because yes. thinner air, you're just falling through the air quicker. And I know this because I've done it a lot and I've, I've documented it. So then the question is, if you know you're going to get less turns up higher and more turns down below, how do you get the average per thousand up? That's the game you're playing. It's not how fast it spins. That, that's important too, but it's really how do you raise the average turns per thousand to the highest possible rate? So I discovered in the plane with a fixed pitch prop, you actually get more, a higher rate of turn, um, and you don't have as much of a change from high to low altitude. So it, it has a lot to do with how a, how a constant speed prop works. The Pitts STB has a constant speed prop. It's constantly adjusting, right, to keep RPM. And notice I, I pointed out in the video on the, on the 98 turn flight at a fixed pitch prop, how the RPMs were increasing as I was descending. So I just, the engine just did what it had to do. The air density and the ability of the engine to make power constrained the RPM of the prop. Because normally a wide open throttle, you get 3000 RPM. By the way, the sound of a 540 at 3000 RPM is music, <laughs> music to the ears. <laughs> so any more? Anyone? Yes? Ooh, I'm, I don't know if I can say this one. I went to Reseda High School. I grew up in the valley. I wore Vans and Topsiders and polo shirts <laughs> in the 80s, the whole deal. Yes? Why inverted? Why inverted? Because it sounds the most cool. I could do them up, right? I mean, there's no record for that. Go out and set it. It just doesn't, it just doesn't, like, it doesn't meet the need to sound dangerous. And I'm being really honest. I mean, it's like, yeah, upright spins, eh. Inverted, ooh. Yes. What went wrong with the Top Gun What went wrong with, I mean, the, the Art Scholl one, the filming one? So everyone knows the story, or has heard the story about when they were filming for Top Gun, Art Scholl, very well-known aerobatic pilot, uh, was in a Pitts S2A. They had camera equipment on the airplane. They were trying to film inverted flat spins for the movie, for the scene when, you know, they have the flat spin and they go in. And so the, the reality is nobody really knows because they never recovered the airplane. Um, I know, I've talked to people who were there, who were, on, who, were, who were in the chase plane, who were on set with him, who knew him. Um, here's what I will tell you about that. A lot of people will not give you definitive answers about the configuration of the airplane when he took off. We all know there were a camera or cameras on the airplane. You cannot find information or talk to anybody or ask people who, who will admit to being there who can tell you the configuration of the, and by configuration I mean how the cameras were. Remember back then they didn't have little GoPros or even small digital cameras. There were big film cameras, right? The Panavision or Airy film cameras. And my understanding is they built some special bracketry for outside the airplane to mount it on the outside. Nobody, will, nobody seems to know exactly what that looked like. And the only thing anyone can figure, and it was between, there were layers of clouds. This is not uncommon off San Diego. And they were trying to capture some footage, and he was between layers. You know, it wasn't fully layered, but it was somewhat partially scattered clouds. As long as you're flying in the part that's not too scattered, or they're scattered farther apart, you're safe. And they theorize, because his radio calls were something like, I have a problem. And they said, I really have a problem. And that was it. And the water's pretty deep. The theory is, one of the camera mounts broke and shifted weight. And the only thing that really could have made it gone wrong was if it broke in the front and the weight moved towards the back of the airplane and created a huge amount of FCG that made recovery difficult or impossible. But no one really knows because they've never been able to recover the airplane or arts body. 
tape since it's been there. But oh, the audio tape uh, has been out, but um, they never got the footage back, right? Because the footage went down with the airplane. And that's all I know about it. And I, I mean, I know, and I know a lot of people in the industry who knew Art personally. I know people who I've talked to who were there when they did it. And no one will talk about what the plane... There don't seem to be any pictures. You know, it's interesting. If you know anything about movie making, they always have still photographers to document the making of the movie. There are no pictures out there anywhere of, of Art flying the pits. So, don't know. We good with questions? Ladies and gentlemen, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you.